Thank you, Henry. Well, we're two neurosurgeons, actually, so it's amazing. Uh, I'm going to report to you the first treatment I did with the, um, uh, this is my other disclosure, uh, with a specific design uh, ultrasound transmitters that I put at the end of the surgical case in order to have a, a simple uh, technique to open the blood-brain bio. This is, so it was a single center study with an escalation dose of acoustic pressure, and the goal was to see safety, but also a secondary objective were um, opening in the MR, and of course clinical efficacy and uh, overall survival in PFS. It was all recurrent glioblastoma because I think that the technique is still new, so we have to do it on a recurrence. Um, the patient was in recurrence after uh, the usual Stoop protocol, and the contrast enhancement tumor was uh, chosen to be less than 35 millimeters just in case there were, could be some edema induced by a blood brain bioopening. We didn't know at that time. And those were uh, the patient treated with carboplatin. Why carboplatin is not a very exciting drug, but it's a very efficient drug in laboratory uh, practice. And we know that it is totally non-toxic. So like this, I won't have any accumulation of two to potential toxicity. So the, 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 the system was implanted. It's a 10 millimeter diameter uh, ultrasound transducer implanted uh, either in the bore holes after the surgery or you can do a de dedicated surgery and a local anesthesia to, to, to put it. And afterwards, every month, uh, the patient is coming, we activate the system by a transdermal needle in order not to have any um, battery inside the body in order to be able to have all the uh, possibility for MR. So tumor resection, sonocloud implantation, seven days after you start the first chemotherapy sessions, and you check it with an MR, and afterwards you go for the, sonic, for, for the drug intravenous administration all in one hour. And afterwards you, you, next for the, you wait for the next session one month after. Here is uh, um, K-trans imaging uh, showing the blood-brain barrier opening. But the most reliable uh, way was to compare the T1 post uh, gadolinium uh, contrast enhancement post ultrasound versus the MR done two days before. Here is an example of this lady. She, is, uh, she had, of course, a, a glioblastoma. And um, she actually received uh, 10 cycles before getting to have a new recurrence. So you saw the system is plugged in, the, the chip is recognized uh, because every chip has a specific impedance of whatsoever. And you see on the, on the left side, the MR is from two days before. And on the right side, the MR performed uh, 20 minutes after uh, sonication. What is amazing in this lady, and that's why I, I put it, is that we are opening the blood-brain barrier in the language area. So it's really if we should have had a, a, a trouble by opening the blood brain barrier, we should have be pointed it out because I asked her to talk during the during the talk during the, the session. And you see that Ultrason are on and she's talking perfectly. And this is a different session so there is no attenuation over time. This is after 10 sonication. You see this T2 star imaging showing no, not at all any bleeding. And um, she had a total removal of the T1 contrast enhancement. So we were following her on flare sequence and you see that over time there is a, a reduction of the flare sequence. Could be due to ultrasound, it could be also due to the, uh, to the carboplatin of course. Another case that was a fast growing tumor because we included at 35 millimeters and when we treated him, 15 days after it was 45 millimeters, so it was pretty scary. And um, this guy actually had 10 sessions because you see that inside a transducer field, the acoustic field, the tumor was not growing, but outside it was growing. Main uh, secondary effect was, was um, transient dexterity deficits for these patients, you see with a big lesion and an edema at day 15, which can be correlated to the tumor anyway, but still. 
Um, Progression-free survival showed uh, an increase and also a statistically significant increase in overall survival also. Um, on the, um, the blue line is the patient for whom the blood brain barrier was sufficiently enough opened. And you see there is some recurrence distant to the acoustic field. Here you see on the frontal lobe, there is some recurrence of the flare signal distant to the acoustic field, but not near the acoustic field, so that uh, we decided to implant three devices. And then we have on the, on the left side, the first patients, 21 patients with uh, 65 sonication, um, implanted with one device, and we added some new patients with three devices. In. Well, so it has shown by now that it was uh, apparently safe, and we have a lot of sonication treatment, so we're pretty confident for the future. The key question is how big should be the uh, blood-brain barrier opening? Apparently, the bigger the better. So for the future, we are uh, now um, making a, uh, an extension of the volume of sonication. Thank you. Beautiful work. If I could just ask, are you, as you expand the area of blood-brain barrier disruption, are you concerned about uh, increasing edema and mass effect and so on? Or, or how do you balance those two? I, I was concerned at the very beginning, of course. The, the patient was a large tumor. Actually, the, uh, the edema was not increased. Uh, it decreases. And uh, so I'm not scared about this anymore. Yeah. But it could be, maybe. But I'm, I'm confident now. It's very exciting advance. Uh, next question there. Where do you think you'll be with the technology two or three years from now? Um, the standard of care. Standard of care, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> now, the fact is we have a hint of efficacy with one transducer, and we're going to increase the field by nine, volume per nine. So it's got to be an increasement, a progressive increasement, but we should have some strong, I don't know, strong efficacy, maybe stronger. Because on 11 patients versus 8 patients with low blood brain by opening and 11 patients with high blood brain by opening, there is a statistical significance already. So, but it's phase one, it's a very tiny number of patients. So, we, but it's a good hint. So I have a question about your, uh, your method of the, how to put the electrode in the, into the uh, adjacent area. Did you also really open the BBB with you know, the, the margin of the tumor or the enhancing part or the, the vessel? How did you really choose the define? place? Yes. Yeah. Uh, by now, I was selecting the most eloquent place next to the tumor mm -hmm. or inside the tumor if I cannot do any tumor removal. Uh, in the future, it was gonna, it's going to cover all the whole tumor bed and two centimeters around. Yeah, but you know, the, if you are choosing the target in the tumor, the tumor area is already they had some the distortion of the BBB. No. So it can make some issues. So how no. did you handle yeah? The, the BBB is not a one or a zero mm -hmm. concept. It's a gradient. So on a tumor, you have a blood tumor barrier. Mm -hmm. And nobody knows exactly what is yeah. the concentration. Mm -hmm. It's not because you have contrast enhancement that you have a blood-brain barrier sufficiently enough open to get drugs in it. Uh, gadolinium is only one kilodalton. If you take carboplatin, which is a very small drug, it's five kilodaltons. And so if you want to put some antibodies or whatsoever, it's 100 kilodaltons or more. So it's not because you see on MR a contrast enhancing tumor that you, have, you, that you don't have blood-brain barrier. You didn't experience any breathing during, during your procedures? What? Any breathing? The breathing. Breathing. Bleeding. 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 Bleeding, not at all. No? Not at all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.